I am so very excited. Uh, we have an incredible uh, YouTube show for you today. David Von Braun is joining me. I'm going to bring him up on the screen here in just a moment. Uh, you're going to see him positioned in front of an incredible piece that he's working on. Um, but before we do that, I want to tell you a little bit more about David and David's work. We're going to be showcasing a lot of the pieces that he's worked on over the years. We're going to talk a little bit about what he's doing right now. And for all of you spiritual enthusiasts out there, I promise you, you want to watch this all the way through because there is incredible information about how David works with uh, Guy and how these pieces of art have been categorized as multi-dimensional. So we're going to talk about that. I don't want you to go anywhere. So let me introduce uh, David. David Von Braun has spent the last 30 years living in the most dynamic and inspiring cities in the U.S. That includes L.A., San Francisco, New York, Dallas, uh, and Santa Fe. After studying painting with Alexander Hogue and earning a BFA in art, from the University of Tulsa, David has worked in various design fields, absorbing the creative energies of his environment and honing his artistic sensibilities. Throughout his many faceted career, David's spiritual journey has informed his work, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, and is the primary drive behind his life as an artist and current collections of his multi-dimensional paintings. In July 2009, he began painting in oils and has not looked back since. From the very beginning of his painting career, he knew that something felt different each time he painted, but couldn't understand where that feeling was coming from. The international channeler, Lee Harris, who I love and adore, uh, was one of the first to actually inform David that his paintings are considered multi-dimensional and that the unusual feelings he was experiencing were from the channeled guidance he received from his various guides and mentors. I told you, this is going to be a very interesting episode and one you want to watch all the way through. Uh, we are delighted. David, thank you so much for being a part of the YouTube show. And we have a lot to get through today, but let's go ahead and have you say hello to everybody. Oh, well, thank you, Delisa. I'm so excited to actually have this complimentary opportunity. Uh, I feel really blessed by this. And I hope that by meeting with you today and visiting that I will be able to maybe inspire and help guide and direct other people who might be considering a new path or opening a new door in their life also by listening to my story and uh, maybe getting some courage to um, you know, face it on their own and strike out on their own and just see what happens. What do you have to lose? You know, it's your life. It's nobody else's but yours. So live it. Absolutely. Right. And I, I love how you're approaching this because you said to me backstage before we started, you really want to approach this as a, a way for people to learn and to embrace their own gifts and, and their own creativity. So thank you for spending time with us today. Um, we have a lot to get to, but first I want to talk about your shirt, your bandana, you've got crystals, everything that you are wearing today has purpose and meaning. Uh, I'm going to show a picture of it up on the screen as well in case folks can't see it that well. Um, but tell us a little bit about what you're wearing today. Well, uh, we live in a universe that is both electrical it is uh, mathematical and it operates from vibration and frequency. And crystals and the mineral kingdom are one of those venues and those conduits for energy interacting with our lives. And it's not that crystals cause anything to happen. Crystals are a channel or a conduit, much like um, say the the crystal and the crystal radio the crystal and the crystal radio isn't the source of the information it's a conduit for the radio frequency that's coming through and crystals are the same thing they all have their own special and unique value and the the mineral kingdom is not evolving like the human kingdom is the humanity is the mineral kingdom is there it arrived billions and billions of years old it's the same all over our universe, all over galaxies. It's all—it's the same element. Uh, for example, 
I have this pyramid of Numite. And this is the second oldest element on our planet. This is more than 3 billion years old, B billion years old. And um, crystals, I, uh, this necklace that I'm wearing, I call it my power necklace. It's 44 inches around. Numerology plays a huge role in our universe. And 44 inches around, four is the number of the builder. And uh, four plus four equals eight, which is a power number in numerology. The Bible uses numerology in this, all of its figures of speech too. And um, so I call this my power necklace, which I wear every day under my shirt. I don't wear it out of my shirt, but it has, um, it has three different types of turquoise in it. One are little tiny zoomy bears that came from a, a, a trading post that went out of business and they broke down some, some necklaces and divided up the, the bears and sold them in separate lots. Um, I have these larger beads are uh, uh, Sleeping Beauty turquoise, which is one of the most rare types of turquoise there is. Uh, these dark beads in it are hawk's eye which is the dark blue version of tiger's eye, which everyone is familiar with. Those cylinders are imperial topaz. The long uh, extension around there of the same size beads are lapis lazuli and turquoise. It has uh, very tiny Herkimer diamonds in it, which are a complete energy because they're, they're terminated on both ends naturally. That's a natural way of growing. Um, it has a little disc of uh, Libyan desert glass. Uh, it has some um, rounded disc of yellow African opal. So it has a lot of energy. And turquoise is traditionally a very protective uh, element, a very protective crystal. And it's often used um, for children, for babies to protect them, have it around them for them to wear. And that's why the Native Americans use turquoise so much because it was such a peaceful, calming energy that connected them with spirit. And then I also have a, uh, this is actually an inverted triangular shape like my logo, but this is Schoengeit. And Schoengeit is the third oldest element on the planet. It's just about 3 billion years old. Schoengeit comes from Karelia, Russia. And actually, Schoengeit is one of the elements that scientists have been extensive work researching because Shungite has an ability that they do not really fully understand to remove and to dissipate EMFs from our uh, atmosphere. So it helps uh, break down the harmful uh, uh, energy from our cell phones, our computers, et cetera. So, um, uh, so there are some, a lot of conscious left brain benefits to crystals and minerals in our daily world. And of course our computers run on microchips, which are uh, essentially silicone. It be began as being silicone, and now, of course, they're made in laboratories, and they combine other things with them. But the information that comes through our computer goes through a crystal. And I just, for information, I have, this is a piece of raw siliconite. This came from the a silicone mine in the Saxony region of Germany, if you can see it. It feels very cold, but if we had were able to do a demonstration, I had this in a bowl and put ice in the bowl with it, the bowl would be filled with water in less than a minute. It had, it's very strange, it's very creaky to watch just to put some ice on top of this and watch it just as if a hot ray was on top of the ice, just melting the ice like that. Now I have to demonstrate the frequency also, um, I have this pendulum is one that I use, and this is scolocyte and cabinsite. I love cabinsite because it's a beautiful blue. But my hand isn't causing this to move, but you will see once it, it connects with the energy of this, this is going to start spinning and spinning and spinning. My hand may move slightly, but it's difficult to stop something from moving your hand when it's spinning around. Now, if I held this long enough, it would be spinning like a, a helicopter blade. And I'm not causing that to happen. That's the energy that's coming off of the siliconite. So I want so people fascinating. to see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now I, mean, I know that we're my... talking about crystals, David, because 
a, a lot of what we talked about in your bio being an artist that creates paintings and works of art that are multi-dimensional sure. and crystals are assisting and you said you wear purple as a as a bandana and sure. the shirt I showed the picture of up on the screen sure. so what is there some significance to the color purple or that specific shirt uh in in terms of creating your pieces of art well no the the shirt was actually just a uh a shameless bit of self-promotion for myself because of my art merchandise because of my painting of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I have almost all of my art as various types of art merchandise. But the color purple was a, a suggestion I received from a spiritualist minister in Los Angeles who was visiting from London. And um, there's a whole transcript of our conversation on my website on the about page. But uh, she was discussing the three guides that have been with me my entire life. She is one of 11 separate individuals throughout my life who have told me about the same three guides. And one of the guides I actually saw in a dream when I was in high school, he introduced himself. So I do, I have consciously met one of my guides and know who it is. But she asked me about the color purple because I wasn't painting at the time at all. And she had asked me about you know, why I wasn't painting. And um, she, she told me that in, in that lifetime, I had many friends who were artists. It was a period around the end of the uh, 18th century to the early 19th century, after or 20th century, actually, after the World War I. It was a lifetime in Paris. And um, I had many friends who were artists. And um, she said, there's something, she said, you wear purple. And I said, well, not particularly. I mean, I do wear purple, but I don't really think about it. She said, well, there's something about the color purple, the vibration of the color purple, that is very attractive to some of these artists. And I would suggest that you think about wearing purple when you are working on your creative projects or when you begin painting, because it will attract, help you attract the energy of these artists and bring their energy through more effectively and more strong uh, as you work on your project. So, as much as possible, I do wear purple. Now, I do have a lot of amethyst that I wear all over, ring, necklaces, anklets, etc. I have a lot of purple vibration from the amethyst. But um, this also has a very practical purpose because I keep a fan blowing as I paint to keep the fumes from gathering in the room. And so um, it, the fan blows hair all over my front of my face and in my eyes and mouth, etc. So I, I wear a scarf or a bandana on my head to keep my hair from blowing in front of my face and also from blowing in my wet paint. Yeah, because I'm sure <laughs> if chemical studies were done in some of my paintings, there would be a lot of cat hair in my hair and that dried paint, you know. And we're going to talk about, about a special cat a little bit later yeah. uh, in yeah. our discussion. Let's go ahead and talk about what is behind you. You are you are sitting in front of this incredible piece new moon, half moon, full moon. I am going to be pulling up on the screen uh, three images of the work that you're doing behind you, but can you tell us a little bit about what that piece is and, and how it came to you? This, this painting actually measures five and a half feet across, six and a half feet high, and it is a painting of moon clouds. Hence, we have the new moon for the bud, half moon, one that's part partially open and the full moon, the, the full flower at the bottom. And it's, um, as it develops, I, that's why I said you can close up because it's so large, they can't see the tails. But as this is developing, um, I'm being, re I'm receiving the information, the light source is coming from the upper left down to the lower right. And so, and also recently I received the guidance that the um, energy around the leaves is similar, will be similar to Karelian photography, where they can photograph the energy of everything. Now, these, the energy is not complete. It's going to have a lot more to it. But just to get an idea of what it's going to be like, all of the leaves are going to have these rays of energy around it to make the whole painting seem much more magical than it, you know, than it might otherwise be. And um, so, to convey the idea also of the bright light that's coming from the up going down 
you can see it's the beginnings of dark shadows there of the leaves on top of the other leaves, etc. So anyway, I wanted to, once people can see the completed painting, then maybe you'll remember back or on my website, you might see progressive photographs of the development of the leaves. And um, a lot of that is, a lot of that that looks like it might be airbrushed, that sort of soft technique. I actually paint by just by a dry brush technique that I think um, George O'Keefe developed. And with a, a brush that's almost dry, with a little bit of paint on it, I just dab, 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 dab on the uh, canvas itself instead of doing brush strokes on the canvas. And that's how you get sort of that soft, progressive movement in the various levels of color. It is absolutely stunning. I can't wait well, to see, you know, it's it all. Process to figure out how to paint with a large painting because most of my paintings are large. I mean, they'll be at least five or six feet, but one to six and a half by five and a half. And I do have, I do have up to 30 additional paintings already drawn out, ready to be transferred to canvas. And some of those are eight and a half feet long. And I'm beginning to rethink my, my decision on making paintings that large because that is really a completely different way of painting than painting something that's like two by three feet. I mean, you have to really plan on what you're going to do it not get discouraged that after you spent four hours it looks like you've only painted three inches of the canvas you know and you know that you have to go over it 20 more times so anyway it is a process yeah absolutely i, I can't wait to show the viewers today uh, more of the pieces that you've done and the story behind each one let's go ahead i'm going to have you talk about like how did this all start when did you know that you were an artist i believe that you told me that there was something that happened when you were about 18 months old. So tell us about exactly. that. Exactly. When I was 18 months old, not that I remember, but my mother faked the drawing. When I was 18 months old, I drew a cat. And it is a legible cat. It's like a, an oval, small oval with triangular points for the ears at the top of the oval, a much larger oval for the body, whiskers that look like they're coming out from the front. So it's not like, so the cat is, the back of the cat is facing you. So somehow I knew that the whiskers would be in front and didn't extend them into the oval. And then at the base of the large oval is a tail coming up. Now my mother saved that luckily and she wrote on there that I drew it at 18 months old and she had kept it in my baby book. The last time I saw it, she would periodically show it to me throughout my life. The last time I saw it was when I went to visit her uh, when she'd been diagnosed with cancer and she brought that back out to show me that painting. As I think about it, I don't even know if she ever showed anyone else. She may have showed, initially she may have shown um, my grandparents or my father or whatever. I don't know because no one ever mentioned it. And I don't know if she ever showed anyone else. And this is why I'm wondering if she ever did. Because I realized that I created a lot of conflict for my mother by drawing that. I was 18 months old. I had never seen a cat in my life. And I drew a cat. I had only been around dogs. The conflict is, how could I draw a cat? And this was a big conflict for her because she was raised in a very boxed in conservative Christian viewpoint of life. And I realized recently as I'm going through my whole healing process with myself, that she carefully and systematically edited, censored and marginalized me throughout my, while she was alive, because I was a threat to her very controlled life. Now I also, which isn't part of this, but it's also part of that story. Uh, I also, she said, I kept, I woke her up almost every night until I was almost four years old crying. Well, she knew why I was crying. And it's because of my perpetual dreams of my lifetime right before this one, when I was a child in Nazi Germany. And my parents helped run a labor camp. And I was a very happy child. But that lifetime ended with my mother and I, my mother from that lifetime, my mother and I on a train. I remember we were going to Switzerland. The train was filled with businessmen. And I remember seeing Allied troops dressed in camouflage 
skiing from the, the forest, skiing in the snow alongside the train. And at some point, and I didn't know why that was so significant, but the businessmen were very frightened. Everybody was just really frightened. My mother kept telling me that, that it was going to be okay. At some point, the train was blown up. And that ended my life and my mother's life and the lives of all those people. Well, that's that would be very traumatic for any soul to come back in and have that a trauma of checking out that like that. My mother knew exactly, and to her credit, she never just she never said it's only your imagination. Mm -hmm. She would tell her, You're okay now, you're safe now, everything is okay. On some level, my mother always believed differently. She believed in past lives and would talk about it at certain point, points in her life. And other times she would go back into her little safe box and not talk about it at all. But to her credit, she never did do as many people do when children talk about when they're very young, one, two, three, four years old, and talk about, oh, remember when I used to do this and that? Remember when I used to do this and that? And their parents would say, oh, well, it's just your imagination, how cute. Well, the children are remembering their past lives because they haven't completely forgotten yet. They're too close to source. They're too close to coming in. So yes, so I have always known all of my life that I was an artist. That was something that, that was never discredited. Uh, my mother never asked me to bring my art out and show people. My father was the one who would do that. And people would come over and say, oh, bring, you know, whatever it is in school, bring out and show while we're you know, the paintings you did, the drawings you did. He would bring that up. Mother never did. She never really did acknowledge my art that much or anything creative I did when I was designing clothes. She never really, never did really, um, was never enthusiastic about my creativity because that brought attention to me and to my completely different viewpoint of life and experience of life. So I'm thankful she saved that, but I, being an artist was something I always knew and being creative is something I always knew how to do. I could always, I've always been able to put my hands on something. And in my mind, it's like a, an animated schematic. I can see it being created in my mind. I don't know what that gift is, but that's all. That's how I did, learned to design clothes. I was putting things together without even knowing how to thread a sewing machine. And after a, a, a friend of my mother's who taught home economics in the university said, you know, Francis, David's doing things that I don't even know how to do. That's when my mother decided it was time that I learned how to thread a sewing machine. <laughs> you know, so anyway, being creative and being art is something that I always knew, but I did not get the support to my uh, art teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm a victim of the American school system. It sucks. And my school teachers always said, oh, you can do more better. You can do better than that, et cetera. And, um, or you can do, uh, you know, try a little harder. Um, you're too young to be able to do that. Uh, at one point I was accused of plagiarizing something. And mother would, you know, was very upset because the people thought that somebody had done my artwork for me instead of me on seven years old. And, um, but I always knew I was going to be an artist. Now, when I was 15, I painted my first painting. This and one right here, yes. Yes, I call it Parisian Boy. I didn't know anything about painting with oils. I had some oils, I didn't even know how to hold a paintbrush. If you look at that painting in person, it's like I dug into the paint and just smeared paint around to get it to move. Uh, but I wanted people to be certain that they knew it was Paris. So I drew, I painted a little uh, effigy of the uh, Eiffel Tower in back. And as I've researched it, that actually is a uniform of a messenger boy in Paris or in London or whatever at the turn of the century. But where all of that came from, I don't know. But um, I had a very strong drawing uh, within myself to anything that had to do with Paris. And that's where that came from. Um, now, from that point, I painted that, and that was it. And then I had just regular public school classes in art until I got into college, and I took painting classes, which were not really very inspirational either. But with Alexander Ho, who is an inspired uh, American painter, I did learn a lot about the chemistry of oils and um, a lot about uh, a process of, of drawing and composition, et cetera, et cetera. 
beautiful. And then I, I know that you picked back up painting in the summer of 2009. Yes. And so I know that there was that big, long period of time where you painted Parisian Boy. And then you right. picked back up in 2009. Guadalupe District is what I'm going to be showing on the screen okay. next. Yeah. Can you tell us about, about that? that? Well, that's the first painting I did that I painted from photographs I painted uh, that I took in the na first neighborhood I lived in when I moved to Santa Fe. I lived in the Guadalupe District, which is on the east side of the plaza, and lived there for about a year before I moved to the Canyon Road District, which is on the, I mean, on the west side, which is on the east side of the plaza. But that's a house that's why it was just a few doors away from where I live. And some people say, well, why did you paint 24 7? Does that mean it's like 24 7, like on time? And somebody said, no, it's very practical. That was the street numbers of that house that I painted. So there's nothing really mysterious or no hidden messages in this painting at all. But at this point, I was beginning, I was painting from my ego because it was something that I knew to paint. Um, I didn't really understand how I was getting a lot of the techniques to come about because I I hadn't painted in a very long time. I didn't I didn't remember anything about my art lessons, etc. But that was my first painting. And that actually is uh, six feet tall. That's like four feet by six feet, I think it is. So that was my first painting was like go big or go home. And so um, that was the first one I painted. And the reason I started painting was as Louise Hay always said in her meetings, um Sunday is not a day of the week so she said if you want to do something don't say someday I'm going to do it you will never do it because Sunday is not a day of the week so apparently it was everything as I was just building up and building up and building up and I thought if I'm ever going to paint I better paint now what if I'm absolutely horrible at it well how will I know that unless I paint and then I can say, well, I tried and I sucked, and so that was it. You know, get rid of the paints and get rid of the canvas. So that was really the very unglamorous reason why I began painting. It was, took a lot of courage, a lot of deep breaths, a lot of energy, and I said, I don't know what I'm doing, but today I'm an artist, I'm a painter, and I'm going to paint. And I started working on that. And I stumbled and I fell and I picked myself back up, and that was the result. And I was sort of relieved, like, <laughs> oh, I don't think I really suck. But now what I'm going, what am I going to think? Because I was relying on my ego. And one thing that I have discovered, and one piece of advice that I will give everyone, no matter what they do, or whether what they want to do is, if you come to a creative block, it's because you're listening to your ego and you are not listening to your inner source. Because your inner source creates worlds. Your ego was developed to help you survive the saber-toothed tiger. Period. End of discussion. So as I painted more after that, I realized that I was receiving information from sources I really didn't understand, but I was just going with it. And I realized that I was surrounded with different types of energies, depending upon what the painting was, which I didn't really understand, but I realized that I was being somehow guided from something I couldn't see, and it was not my ego, on creating various paintings. And so that was the result. Now, after that, yeah. um, it wasn't that difficult for me to then decide what to paint because I sort of was beginning a little bit of a flow and I was noticing different things around me uh, to paint that were interesting. So I was beginning to unconsciously pick up on guidance. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was guidance, but I was being guided. Um, now, the, the um, uh, first painting that I, that I, well, let's say three paintings after this, um, I had something planned Paint, which was uh, I was taking from a lithograph I did in college, and I kept seeing this full, this huge full moon, seeing this, seeing this, seeing this painting, and so I just said to whoever, "Okay, I will do this next painting." I throw in the towel, 
whatever. I had no idea what I was going to paint. And I think later on, we're going to discuss my painting of under a cloudy moon. But that was yep. that. We're going to, yeah, we're going to get there. Uh, we have a few more to show before we get there. Well, Let's talk about Our Lady of Guadalupe. Let me go ahead and bring that one up on the screen here, which is absolutely stunning. Um, I know you featured Our Lady of Guadalupe in paintings as well as St. Francis of Azizi. So what's the, the well, story behind this? That was very practical because I was doing Santa Fe related paintings. Sa uh, Our Lady Guadalupe is the patron saint of Santa Fe. And so a lot of Santa Fe has Guadalupe this, Guadalupe that. And so that's why I painted Our Lady Guadalupe. Now on both of those paintings, the design format was to be Art Deco. So um, you'll see that I have some stylized plantings at the bottom that are an Art Deco design. Um, the the uh, stars all around actually are from a, uh, they're a very famous design made, made famous by Matisse. That's how he painted a lot of his uh, stars with that design. Now, I did a lot of study on uh, the origins of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And um, this is where my inspiration would come from all areas. Now you see the halo at the top of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and you see doves that are in the halo and, and emerging from the halo. Well, I saw a little ink bowl that had birds in it. And I thought, why that would be fabulous to have as a halo for Our Lady of Guadalupe when the birds, which is represent the Holy Spirit and also peace, would be emerging from her halo. Um, the rays that are very traditional around Our Lady Guadalupe are actually stylized leaves of the agave plant, which is throughout Mexico and the southern parts of the United States and Southwest, etc. And those come from their stylized agave leaves. And that's something that's just on every Our Lady Guadalupe that's been painted. Interestingly enough, I have had a number of Roman Catholic priests tell me this is their favorite depiction of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I did not paint this traditionally. Most Our Lady of Guadalupe paintings are painted with her in this beatific smile with her hands in a very like position. She's looking up toward the heavens, etc. To me, this is a representation of the divine feminine. And the divine feminine, centuries, thousands of years ago, millennia uh, years ago, was goddess, the divine feminine. And she was known as Sophia. And Sophia represents wisdom. If you will notice, the hands in Our Lady Guadalupe are held in this mudra that represents wisdom. That's my hidden message in this painting. Many people who are, who are onto that said, that's the reason I love your painting, because you are depicting images of divine feminine and not a traditional Roman Catholic symbol. Um, that was used to sell soap. And so uh, I thought, well, why does Our Lady Guadalupe have these different um, identifiable characteristics? Like, why is she standing on a crescent moon? Why is she wearing a pink dress? Why is she wearing a robe that has stars in it? And one thing I learned was those are all distinct characteristics of Aztec goddesses. The church was having a difficult time convincing the indigenous people that they really need to be controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. And because why would they? They, they had their own deities that were, they were very happy with. And the conquistadors in the Roman Catholic Church didn't exactly make their life a cakewalk. So um, the robe with the stars in it, one of the Aztec goddesses would wear. The pink dress, one of the Aztec goddesses would, would wear. Standing on the crescent moon, one of the Aztec goddesses, she must have been a moon goddess. So the marketing committee of the church all got together and created Our Lady Guadalupe and then developed the story. And there she is. Now, to me, she represents the divine feminine, which I think in our collective subconscious, we all relate to the divine feminine. I think children especially do. I remember that. Uh, when I used to attend uh, lectures on our Course of Miracles with Marianne Williamson at St. Thomas Episcopal in Hollywood, she was raised as a Reformed Jew. But she said there was something about 
Mother Mary, the Virgin Mary, that appealed to her, even when she was eight and nine years old. And she said her mother would walk in as she was praying to the Virgin Mary. And here she was a nine-year-old Jewish girl, you know. And I remember as I was young, there was something that was very comforting and healing about the Virgin Mary to me. And I certainly did not have any kind of a background that related to the Virgin Mary in any complimentary way at all. So um, I think that there's a collective subconscious for the, the divine feminine, which I believe we are evolving back toward. But I know as further education that the, the, uh, the goddess Isis, which is what I learned in my art history classes, there would be many times the church would take over a site, a religious site or whatever. And one day it was the temple of Isis, the next day it was whatever the church wanted to call it. So we had these statues. This statue on Monday was Isis and baby Horus. On Tuesday, it was the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. Same statue, rebranded. You know, but that iconic, that subconscious icon is in our collective subconscious all over the planet. And the, the goddess, the church didn't even stop there. The goddess Isis was known as the goddess of a thousand names. The Cathedral of Notre Dame was built on the largest temple to Isis outside of Egypt, which is something that Napoleon knew. And so when he created his coat of arms, he depicted Isis sailing her barge up the sand to establish Paris, which pissed off the Pope, which made Napoleon's day. I mean, he and the Pope lived to hate each other. And so, Notre Dame Cathedral was built on the ruins of the largest uh, temple to Isis. Now, the goddess of a thousand names, one of her names was Our Lady. One of the names of Isis was Queen of Heaven. One of the names of Isis was Mother of God. Sound familiar? <laughs> the church just took it all and accepted it and rebranded it and said, it's ours now. <laughs> so anyway. That's why Our Lady Guadalupe is, was painted. And that's why to me it's very special because it represents the divine feminine, which we all have within us. And it's our creative nature. And that also will relate into my logo as we get into discussing my logo and the triangles, et cetera. But the practical answer to all of that long, uh, to the question is all a long answer is, I painted Our Lady of Guadalupe and St. Francis because they are icons of Santa Fe. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, let's go to uh, this seventh yes. chakra. Uh, I know you've shared with me that, and we've already mentioned it already, that you have guidance uh, yes. that helps you create these different pieces. So can you tell us about seventh chakra and how you may have felt guided uh, or channeling while you did this piece now i that actually was that was the one that was taken from a lithograph i did in university and uh that was what i was going to paint as my third painting and that is the one that this information in my brain kept saying don't paint it don't paint it don't paint it paint this other painting with this huge full moon which was under a private moon but as I painted that, I wanted the sort of the feeling of the golden energy of the higher energies where we're connected to our divine, to our seventh chakra, which is the top of our head, the soft part of the baby's head. That's the connection to the seventh chakra. Now I have seen, it's discussed in the Bible in the New Testament where it talks about Pentecost and the people had flames of fire from the top of their head. They, you know, the spirit had descended. I have seen that two different times in people. It's because they are so elevated at a spiritual level. It actually looks like, I wouldn't call it fire, but in a sort of a crude way, I suppose, uneducated people would only understand that. It looks like white tongues and flames of, of light flickering at the top of their head. It's, it's a very beautiful, mesmerizing type of experience. But, that's the seventh chakra. So I painted that from a uh, perspective of bringing in that energy. The, the sky in the background is like uh, flowing, it's billowing, it's, it's, it's effusive with 
with golden light and I was rays of, of orange and you know, it was filled with light. And uh, even though it's an older building and some of the exterior may be cracking off and showing the base like the bricks and stuff, it still has a substantial strength to it. And that's what I feel like our spirituality and our faith is once we realize that the truth of our being is very ancient. And no matter what man-made creations we try to bury it in, they are still underneath to help us find our truth and to find our connection to source and ultimately to realize that we are source, that we, that you are the Lisa, you are source experiencing this lifetime as the Lisa. I am source experiencing this lifetime as David Ron Brown. We are all source. There is nothing that is not source. And that this is eternal life by definition. There's been no beginning. There will be no end because as, as quantum physics and science tells us, nothing is created or destroyed, it transmutes. So even if it's not a physical universe, it will transmute into something else. It is perpetual. That's the whole, that's the whole point. We are part of perpetual life. And I think that is what holds a lot of people back even uh, from living what's within them is that they don't realize that there's nothing to lose. You are perpetual life. You have more health and assistance around you than you could possibly imagine. Uh, all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask. Amen. <laughs> we live in a free will universe, which means we have to ask. And I wasn't a great believer in angels for a long time, even though people would give me a lot of gifts of angels. But I have learned since that angels are here. We all have a guard, at least one guardian angel when we're born. It's assigned to us, everyone, everything. Even, even the animals have angels to protect them. As the Bible says, even every blade of grass has an angel. The Kabbalists believe that. And, um, uh, but we have to ask. And other than being in a point of an untimely, written by an untimely death, angels will not interfere. We have to ask for help. Even the Bible, it says, when they're tempting Jesus, it says, all you have to do is ask, and the angels will, will keep your feet from you know, being hurt, etc. All you have to do is ask. It's all back to our word. We ask what words we speak. We ask. So ask your angels. Ask your guides. Just say, you know, this is what I told my angel, the angels. They said, you know, this is it. Let's be, let's be clear to your kids. I don't really believe, I mean, believe you in you as a, as a messenger, but I don't really buy that little fluttery wing thing. That's just a little too warm and fuzzy for me. So I'm willing to give it a go. We can work together. That's fine with me. I'll throw caution to the wind. Let's see what happens. Beautiful. And then yeah. beautiful, beautiful. I love it. I love all of it. Uh, I'm enjoying this very much. Uh, let's go on to Paradisum. I'm going to show five progression photos up on the screen here. And uh, I know that your guides uh, were likely you know, involved in the creation of this very piece nice. as well. So I'm going to start showing that. And if you'd like to tell us about this piece, that would be great. And this is one that really shows how at the last minute, as my guides always do, they, they save the day. When I'm working on a painting, my question is, when I finish painting the day, have I completed this step successfully in my painting as I move toward world-class version of painting? And they'll tell me yes or no. And because in, in the quantum field, there are countless versions of everything. As Jesus said, in my father's house in many men, we select what we want. So if I want to put a little bit of energy out, I'll do a painting that has a little bit of energy coming back. If I want to do, do an incredible painting and really bust my ass, I'll create a painting that's incredible and that I bust my ass over. Now, Paradisum is I had the idea of a bird of paradise, but a different one. So that little profile thing that you see painted all the time, I want something very different. Well, I think this is different. So I spent a lot of time working on the background on the reeds. 
And by the way, this entire painting is painted with glazes, which means it's a very thin coating of color. Usually there's no solid thick paint on here at all. I mix, I keep extensive notes. I mix glazes 502 times on this painting. So even if I spent one hour on a little bit of color, that means I spent 502 hours. I spent over a thousand hours on this painting. It's three feet by five feet. So I began to develop the painting and um, I was pleased with the way it was coming out. I was getting much brighter colors than most oil paints do because I was working with glazes. So I could paint one color underneath, a different color on top, and a different color on that. And you have three colors coming through to create what looks like even a brighter color than it would be um, if you just had a solid paint on there, which would be sort of flat looking. This has a lot of depth to it. So as I began to develop it, I was pleased with the way it was developing, but there was something that just did not work for me. And I said, okay, good. So I call it painting team DVD. I said, okay, painting team DVD. There's something that's just not, I don't know, it's, it's weak. It's missing something. It's just not really working for me. So what can we do? And on, they suggested that I bring in what would look like um, orange stain on the upper left placed it on the painting uh, to see where it would best fit. And then I painted the paint it in and boom, that was it. So on the final photograph of the painting, you can see how by this progression, how that little bit of orange up there in the upper left totally saved the painting and made it work. There it is. And that to me, to me it, it like finishes it off. That's the capper a little strip of orange, and that was it. And that was my guide's answer. And that was, they always bring it out at the last minute. I know there's always going to be a save at the last minute. And that was the most unique first save I have. Um, I had another save on, I think the next thing we're going to discuss, which is my thing with the cactus flower pair of these. I mean, uh, uh, are you serious? But, yeah, are you serious? There's going to be six progression photos that I'm going to show this one. So yeah, let's jump right in. Here we okay. go. Now I had the idea for the cactus flower. This is uh, actually taken from a photograph of a uh, Portofino series of cactus flower. And so I, I painted, you'll see the yellow around that. Most artists will paint what they call an underpainting. That's so that that color will, will show through in a color spectrum, even though uh, it might not be seen as part of the final painting, but having that into the white background actually makes the color more vivid when you look at it. So I had that, I liked the drawing, and I said, okay, what are we going to do for the background? And so the message I got was vertical stripes. But, oh, okay, well, that works. That's better than having horizontal stripes or something with a lot of detail because those petals really take up a lot of space. So I tried to think of, you know, being very practical and still in my ego brain. Okay, what would my vertical stripes be? What colors are they going to be? And they said, no, we vertical stripes like the stripes created by the plant itself. Okay, okay well, that works for me. And we said, and then you're going to paint those as pointily, which did not really make me happy, but it sounded like a fabulous idea. So you can start seeing the dots. Pointillism, as we develop the go along, pointillism is thousands and thousands tiny dots. I probably spent at least 300 hours painting the tiny dots. Every bit of detail is painted by dots. There are no connected lines in the background at all, except for when I drew in the uh, spikes or the thorns. Everything is a dot. And you'll notice that these elongated petals in the back are like yellow and orange. And before I finished it, there were reds and purples, and they were all different colors. And I didn't understand why I was doing that. But anyway, that's what my guide just told me to do. So as this developed, I don't know if I, I may have sent a photograph or the, um, there's more of the developed background. I don't know if I sent a photograph with a, a ruler on it or not. But anyway, I wanted everyone to be able to see as much as possible that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of little 
tiny dots there. Yes, it really was. So you can see all of those tiny dots overlapping each other. And all of those um, are building a definition in the background. So uh, I went from that, we got to the you know, painting, I got the uh, finalized painting, which is what this is. And um, my guides, and I still had the orange and the yellow and the red, the purple in the background, those long petals. And so this was, the, this was an incredible save by my guide. And I said, okay, you know, the, the overall, the background is fabulous. The overall painting I really like, but with those oranges and yellows and things in the background, I don't know, it's just really not working for me. So how are we gonna do this? And they said, paint everything with a medium glaze of quinacridon magenta. I love the name quinacridon magenta, but paint it with quinacridon magenta. I painted over the yellow, the orange, the red, the purple, the white, et cetera, with quinacridon magenta, and it blended everything in and gave it definition. And that was like, boom, that was it. There's the painting. It was absolutely, I had never, I haven't had that much experience in painting, but I had never seen such a dramatic difference that having the same color of paint on every one of those elongated petals in the background created an overall effect and brought it all together. And that was it. Sign off, paint your logo, next. <laughs> it's stunning. I love the colors and it, it really pops for me. Uh, we're gonna look at a couple more that I really love of yours. I mean, they're all fabulous, right? Brother oh, Sun and Coyote Moon are going to be next here. So uh, Brother Sun, and you actually sent me a greeting card and the greeting card is this piece that you did and i opened it up and he does have these for sale on his website um shameless plug <laughs> yeah. and i got this in the mail though and i opened it and i took my breath away it is stunning so you have to tell us the story behind this well uh brother son thank brad as i said is an icon of santa fe santa fe and San Francisco are two cities in America that were founded by the Franciscans, the Order of St. Francis. And um, Santa Fe was founded uh, by King Philip back in the 1500s. But um, the, the, I don't remember what it is in Spanish, but the official name of Santa Fe would not fit on a postcard. The official name is, in English, the Royal Village of the Holy Faith of St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> New Mexico. Well, it wasn't New Mexico then, but I mean, that was the long name. So it's called Santa Fe, which is Holy Faith. And it could also be uh, Holy Spirit, but it was Holy Faith. And so Franciscans founded Santa Fe. Well, um, and the, um, uh, so Brother Son is what Santa, uh, St. Francis called himself. And again, my whole design depiction was as um, Art Deco type of design. And so, which of course brings in a lot of Egyptian symbology. You'll see in the upper right and left corner, you see the sun with the hands that are out, outstretched. And in, if you see that on any of the hybrids, et cetera, what is that is saying is Ra, or their name for uh, the Supreme Being or God, um, only gives and never takes because those hands are open as they reach down toward the heavens, as they reach down toward the viewers, depict saying that God only gives. God never takes away anything from us. Now there's the winged solar disc, which is very uh, Egyptian. I think the Unity Church adopted that. Many different movements and, and organizations have adopted the solar disc. It's also a symbol for the Holy Spirit, but it was a very important uh, symbol that I was told to include in this because, of course, St. Francis was very connected with uh, his divine presence. Um, I had detected the, the wolf uh, that followed him as one of his favorite stories. Uh, another story about him where he preached to the birds in the trees. And so those are all uh, three different types of birds that live in the Assisi area of uh, Italy. Um, I brought in the sunflowers. There's a lot of depiction that I describe on my website of symbology, of numerology, and stuff within the painting. <clears throat> but one thing 
and also the the view has been looking up in almost total bliss. He's like in a blissed out state. And so he is he is fully connected, but you'll see at the bottom of the painting, it looks like cement. Well, it's a story of transformation. It starts out, he and the wolf start out as a cement statue in the garden. And as they're transformed and the energy moves up, they move up into spirit. So it's it's a subtle story of transformation of us all as we move towards spirit and toward our higher self and our higher calling. Now, I have a mutual friend who lives in um, uh, British Columbia. And she, a few years ago, she said, did anyone tell you that Wayne Dyer had seen your painting of Brother Son before, about a month before he died? He said, no, they hadn't. Well, she was a very close friend of Wayne Dyer. He wrote about her in two of his books. The reason they were close friends was because Wayne Dyer believed that he was St. Francis in that lifetime. He believed that he was St. Francis. And he told people when he saw my painting that, that was his favorite painting of St. Francis he had ever seen. And the reason my friend was connected with this is because she was one of the early followers of the order of St. Francis. And she and Wayne Dyer had compared stories of their experiences with both of them living in that lifetime. So I know there are a lot of people that say, oh, no, I was St. Francis. 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 Well, the fact that two people who live in completely different countries were able to compare the same stories on a lifetime they both shared together sort of cast my vote towards it. Probably Wayne Dyer, if anybody else was, who was St. Francis in that lifetime. But that's just another you know, interesting energy that's around my painting. Now, this painting is four feet by five feet. Uh, another fairly large painting, but um, I think the the depiction of bliss comes across subconsciously for people. I know that uh, one person I know who had absolutely no religious upbringing at all, absolutely, he wears my shirt that has this. Um, I've been told he sometimes will wear it four days in a row because it feels so wonderful and so connected with the sun when he wears it. He has a large printing of it on his wall. He has it where he can see it when he first wakes up in the morning. The, uh, some person, a, a customer, ordered this particular painting as a jupe print on canvas of the original size, of course, he's about five feet. He uh, lived in Los Angeles, and he said he hung it at the foot of his bed. So when he would wake up in the morning, that would be the first thing he saw. When he went to bed at, la at night, that was the last thing he saw. So how it helps people is really wonderful and I think gets to that whole topic of discussion of the multi-dimensionality of my paintings because there's nothing that I put in there consciously and I know that when I finished this painting um, someone I knew I was impulsive when I finished it someone I knew who was dying of lymphoma had called me and she said I want to see your painting as soon as you finish it so I called her and she came over. She went into the room where this was hanging. She turned her chair around and sat across the room and looked at it and she's staring at it. I went about my business doing things, you know, et cetera, et cetera, around the house. She sat there for a full hour, didn't say anything, just staring at the painting. It was, it was almost freaky, but it was like, it was a surreal spiritual moment I could tell. And I was thinking, what is she receiving through this? What is going through her mind? Because she's a very kinetic person. She was always a very dynamic, go, go, go type of person. And she had a lot of angst about not being able to fight lymphoma, a lot of anger over it. And she just sat there in the chair, like I'm sitting here, just transfixed on this painting. Not that I'm special at all because I painted it, I'm not at all. But it's what I, what I was guided to paint and the message that was being that this painting was being used to reach one person um, was important to me. Uh, and so I personally think that, that my painting would be fabulous for like the, you know, some international uh, campaign for saving wildlife, and saving the planet, et cetera, et cetera. I would love to have my painting, um, you know, be the focal point of that. But, um, 
that's why I painted it was because it of St. Francis connection to Santa Fe and also my connection to the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom and the mineral kingdom um, as a member of the second race soul group uh, because that's, that's what we are attracted to and to helping on the planet while we're here in this lifetime. Um, but anyway, so that's that and, and also the art deco designs in it. As I said, this one and our little blood loopy, my uh, intent as I drew out the drawing was that it had art deco feel to it. Um, because I love art deco anything. I but, love it. Yeah. I put okay. I just put Coyote Moon up here. <laughs> the Coyote Moon. Now this is the painting I was going to paint as my third painting of 20 page seven chakra. This painting was like in my mind. I mean, I, I could not get it out of my brain. It was like haunting me for days. And I was, you know, being very stubborn. I mean, I'm going to paint seven chakra. And I could, I mean, I could, it was like almost I was blinded by this painting. I couldn't see it. My eye, physical eyes couldn't see anything but this painting. So, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I had no idea what I was doing. I just, this one I really just followed like a guidance. I didn't know what to do, but I'm going to be doing it anyway, even if it's wrong. And I just started painting. Um, it's fauve, and fauve means, um, well, fauve actually is a French word that means beast, because around the turn of the, in the 20th century, many of the fauvists, like uh, Gauguin and Matisse, um, would paint things like the sky was yellow, or the grass was blue, or whatever, you know, red, or whatever. And so this is done in fauve colors because we don't have purple skies, we don't have red trees like this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's faux, it's, in, it's impressionism, it's also surrealism, but um, I painted it and it was sort of a struggle for me because it was so different. This is my third painting from the time I started painting. I had never done anything that was not realism before. And so I painted it and I thought, oh my God, what have I painted? I mean, I don't know what I've painted. I, I was afraid to show people. I seriously, I was afraid to show people. I thought people are going to think that I'm absolutely out of my fucking mind. I mean, it's just, it's like, it, it's, it just doesn't fit the norm. It doesn't fit the mold. You know, they're going to laugh at me. They're going to think, you really don't have any talent at all. But I went ahead and I showed people the painting and people sort of loved it. I mean, at first I thought, it's sort of like a car wreck. You can't take your eyes away from it, you know? But I mean, that wasn't it at all. They really liked it. When this was in my first exhibition, which wasn't at a gallery, it was at a gallery, but it was like a public gallery at a, a performing arts center. I noticed uh, on the opening night, there were two little girls who were, I'd say about seven years old. A lot of people stopped and just stared at the painting. These two little girls stood about three feet from the painting. And as I said, they were young. For young children to even stand still for a minute or something. These little girls must have stood there for five minutes staring at the painting. And finally, one little girl just sort of cautiously stepped forward and gingerly put her hand out and touched the painting for a second and pulled it back. And I thought, what's going through that child's mind? I mean, what, what, are they, what are they getting? What is the message? What are they, how are they being affected? And then I was I was at that same gallery a few days later with a friend of mine who's an artist, and a father brought his little boy in. And um, since there were no other people there except me and my uh, friend, uh, he brought his little boy in. And the father was his little boy was I'd say about four years old, and his father was very excited, and he said, "I want you to see this painting. I want you to experience this painting." Well, his father was not what you would think would be like some artificial model. I mean, he was dressed in, you know, biker leather, all inked up, and his little boy looked like a Botticelli angel, you know, a little curly hair, etc. And, uh, but he was so animated about my painting. I thought, well, this is really an interesting study. So uh, he said, I want you to see this painting. Now look over here. Now look over there. Now look at that up there. Now remember this painting. You know, he was just, it was absolutely amazing. The father was just so, captivated by the painting and the little boy was just like big eyes just you know looking at the painting 
And I thought, wow, thank you for that gift. I mean, what a gift is that, that um, I was able to experience that moment for myself as a creative person, for myself as a spiritual being, to realize that there is some value to my work and to my being here at this time. I just need to continue to work on getting out of my own way and doing whatever I came here to do. But there were those two interesting experiences and this is from painting that I was afraid to show anyone. That I almost thought, you know, I'll just hide this in the closet, not really ever show anybody to paint it. So anyway, that's sort of an interesting uh, anecdote about some, and this painting is like 40, 40 or 42 inches wide and 55 inches, I mean, high and 55 inches long. So it's another decent size painting. Mm -hmm. Or as my friend who sells art in Dallas says, it's a living room painting you know, that you put over the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it evokes, when I look at this, uh, I mean, I could you know go on and on about each of the, the pieces we've looked at today. Um, for me, when I see this, I feel like it's Neptune energy. I feel like it's a dream state. It feels right. exactly. uh, very much like um, sort of a fairy tale Alice in Wonderland yes. uh, curiosity to it. So, yeah, yes. I'm glad you showed it. <laughs> yes. Well, the coyote moon, you know, is an expression in the Southwest. And the coyote is the trickster. Um, the, the coyote is about fantasy and about things not being as they seem. That's the coyote. And um, a coyote moon uh, is supposed to mean a very magical, mysterious moon. So that was my background of painting this particular painting. Beautiful, beautiful. I want to show your logo on the next slide um, oh, yeah. because I know you have a little bit of a story around your logo versus signing your name. So how did this triangle and DVD well, come in? Uh, I would agree in marketing and merchandising. And um, I know that brands like Yves Saint Laurent with YSF and Coco Chanel with Sisu, you know, et cetera, all of those are more easily identifiable and recognizable with public than having to remember the long. I mean, Let's face it, the majority of people have the attention span of a man with ADHD. And so if you can give them something really fast, they'll grab onto it mentally and then move on. So I knew that I wanted to sign my painting for the DVD. Now, DVD, the numerical value of the letters, D, V, and B, in the numerology of Kabbalah, the Chaldean numerology, and the Vedic numerology all add up to a three. Now the numeric three devotes, denotes an expression of a vivid, a vivid creative imagination, which is you know what one would want with their art, and also another subconscious um, icon to the world is the importance of a trinity. All religions have a trinity. We have, and the, the triangle represents um, the uh, spirit, body, mind. Um, uh, triangle uh, represents the joyful side, or the three represents the joyful side of our experience. And the inverted triangle like this, oh, I've gotten ahead of myself. So I signed it with DVD. Then my guide said, put it inside of a triangle. So I tried the upright triangle, I tried the inverted, they said, no, the inverted triangle. So they said, that's like a mark, a master's mark in silver, a master's mark in, in uh, ceramics, a master's mark in, uh, you know, whatever you're making from the old time, you know, a long time ago, they had a master's seal. And that's like a master's mark, a logo. So the inverted triangle. So what's the inverted triangle? The inverted triangle represents the divine feminine. It represents creativity ascending to the physical plane. Um, in our in our uh, dual universe, uh, in our electrical universe, electrical charges are a positive charge and a negative charge. We have assigned the positive charge as a masculine energy. We have assigned the negative charge as a feminine energy. 
when they are on top of each other, which means the energy is balanced, then it forms what we now call Star of David. The Star of David was carved into Egyptian temples and Vedic temples thousands of years before there was a Hebrew on the planet. <clears throat> so the Star of David symbol is around, has been around for eons, and it represents the balanced energy of masculine and feminine. But the inverted triangle represents the creativity descending to earth. And so that's where um, uh, I got this symbol. And so this is what I was guided to take. It was like a, a guidance from spirit. This is what you're going to sign your paintings with because you're going to be, this is another energetic, multidimensional message people are going to be getting, whether they know it or not. When they look at this, the, the inverted triangle is going to be telling them this creativity descending to earth spirituality descending the earth. The DVD is the three, they're going to pick up the vibration of three on the triangle and on the letters, whether they consciously are aware of it or not, because we're vibrational beings. It's all there. I mean, there's a lot of subconscious programming we get from a lot of subversive things that we aren't aware of. So subconscious programming is very much part of our experience, of our life experience, and it has been throughout history. Yeah. So anyway, that's why. And then, of course, uh, the background for the, for my logo on my website like this is the the lavender and the purple color, because that's very important in the overall story of my creation of art. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, all very important to the, the frequency of your work. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. We got to talk about Lorelei the cat, because oh, yeah. you... <laughs> You sent over these illustrations that I have up here on the screen, and I know this is a project that you are working on. So uh, tell the audience, I, I know we're getting ready to close out our interview for today, but tell everybody what Laura Lee the Cat is about. Okay, Laura Lee is a series of children's books that I'm in the process of developing, and I wanted to mention them here also because I would like to be able to connect with other people who maybe have a story that would like to work with me in collaboration of their stories um, about Lorelei the cat. I'm the illustrator, but Lorelei is a world traveling cat. And she, uh, at the end of every story, her realization from her travels is that deep down inside, everyone is the same. All beings are the same. We all want to love and be loved. We all want to uh, have security. We all want to be happy. Um, we all want to have peace in our lives. But she goes around and she learns about different cultures. One of the stories that uh, about um, uh, where Lorelei and her visits is to uh, Lemitage Museum in St. Petersburg, um, which is founded by St. Uh, by Catherine the Great, um, and uh, Lermitage, for a long, long time, has had cats who actually are employees of the museum, and they're the, the Hermitage cats. And the reason the cats live in the museum is because the museum was having great difficulty with rats destroying the art. Mm -hmm. And so they thought they would bring in the cats to keep the rats at bay, and it's been successful. But there are actually cats that live at Lermitage, and Lorelei is going to go visit the cats that work at Lermitage, and that's one of the stories. Um, so there are many things like that, uh, where Lorelei brings from the past, brings from the present, brings from uh, all different cultures, showing that basically programming the children to realize that basically we're all the same inside, um, just like they do. We all want to be loved. We all want to to be loved, and we all want peace and harmony and happiness in our lives. So that's the story of Lorelei. Um, so if if there are any people that have stories uh, that are interested in that, I would love to hear from them. And on my website, there's a contact page that they can leave me their contact information. And, um, you know, we can just discuss it. Uh, so this is ongoing. It's nothing that's immediate, and it's nothing that has an ending. So I would like to, to crank out 
uh, as many books as possible a year to reach as many children as possible all over the world. So that's my intention on this project. I love it. So yeah, make sure you reach out to David on his website. I've had the uh, website address at the bottom of each slide, but it's dbbpaintings.com. Yes, uh, to make sure, yeah, make sure that you connect with David on there. If, if Lorelai the cat speaks to you, which I'm sure some of the folks watching will want to reach out and collaborate. While we're on the subject of cats, we need to show your cat buddy. Um, yeah. Heart-shaped nose, you can see that in that very clear photo there uh, on one side. And then he's got his baby in the other photo. So tell us a little bit about Buddy. Well, little Buddy, little Buddy's a rescue. He will have been with me for two years next month in November. And uh, little buddy is a survivor of a devastating house fire. And um, also his diabetes was just reactivated about a year ago. But he's a good little boy. He's a really a uh, fighter and he's doing really well in overcoming his diabetes. But his baby is an important part of this story. And um, the, he lived with another kitty. And the other kitty was an orange striped tabby. And the other kitty wasn't as fortunate as Buddy uh, and didn't make it. So at some point, someone, whether it was a previous owner or a friend of hers or whatever, got him this little neck vibrator thing with a, a cat, a little orange striped tabby, and got it for him to sleep with. And he grooms that at night before he goes to sleep. And he snuggles up to it. And that's his baby. So that may be a substitute for his little friend that didn't make it or it just may be like when children sleep with their teddy bear i don't know but it brings him a lot of comfort and um it's very sweet and he's a very very sweet kid he's a big kid from the tip of his nose to the base of his tail he weighs it's about 24 inches and he weighs a little over 20 pounds so he's a big boy but he's a very sweet little boy and um he I have brought a cabinet in close to where I'm, I paint to store things. And um, it's just two like wide shelves. And as I was putting things in the top shelf, then he climbed into the bottom shelf and he went, oh, this is great, another cave. So he claimed it and I put a rug in. So that's where he sleeps as I paint a lot of times. It's on that, but that's his little cave. Um, but uh, anyway, that's that's our Mr. Buddy. And I call him Buddiness. Um, but um, yes, I've always had, almost always had cats, even though I didn't when I my young years, uh, I had dogs. But um, in my adult life, after I lived in New York, I realized, you know, cats are much easier to take care of than dogs. Dogs have to get out, rain, snow, sit and hail, so they can pee and poop. And cats, litter box, clean it, that's it. No mouse, no fuss, you know, so. He's so cute. <laughs> Thank you for sharing Buddy with us. I love seeing him with this baby. Okay. That's adorable, adorable. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, a couple things I just want to call attention to. And then in a moment, David, I'm going to ask you to share any parting words of wisdom that you want to sure. close out with. But let me show your website. I've got uh, your website pulled up here. And again, it's dvbpaintings.com. Uh, and you can find all kinds of great information on here and as was mentioned there is a place on the website where you can purchase merchandise like i was talking about the card that you sent me there's so many things on here you have socks which i love i'm a sock person um and you graciously mailed me a bag that has one of your paintings on yep. the bag itself i'm waiting for that to show up i'll update everybody once uh once it arrives i'll take a picture of it um, but yeah, you've got you've got mugs, you've got cards, you've got socks, you've got bags, you've got all kinds of things on here. They make amazing, unique gifts that you're not going to find anywhere else. So I just want to make sure we talk about your website for a moment. Well, my the quote that I have on quite a few of my pages is from Oscar Wilde, who said, "You should either be a work of art or you should wear a work of art." <laughs> so I agree both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, be a work of art and wear a work of art. I love that quote. That's great. And then again, here's your website, dvbpaintings.com. Uh, I'm going to stop our screen share here and bring us both just back on the screen. Okay. And uh, as we close out, this was fantastic. Okay. Um, 
you've shared a lot of great wisdom, uh, you know, shared your process uh, and how this all came to be. Your artwork is incredible. I can literally feel it when I look at your painting. So I agree, I feel like they're multi-dimensional uh, and that you are channeling while you're, while you're creating these pieces. So as we close out, the last words here, back to you, David, what do you wanna leave people with uh, as we close out today? Well, I think I, I understand the hesitation for someone to want to express themselves in a new uh, dimension of their creativity or their life experience. Something they are not secure with, something that they've never done before, something that they feel might open them up to ridicule. Um, but as Louise Hay said, someday is not a day of the week. And all of my life, I would say, okay, I'm going to work as a fashion designer, I'm going to work as a designer, I'm going to work as a writer, and someday I'm going to tank. And I realized, okay, my Sunday through Saturday, I don't see Sunday in there on the calendar. So the other thing that I have noticed that is very important is when we hesitate to do something, when we hesitate to live our dream, when we hesitate to put ourselves out there, it's because we don't, on some level, love ourselves enough. If you had a friend who said, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, or a family member, oh, I want to do this, I want to do this, you would want them to do it. You would encourage them to do it. Be that friend to yourself. Just forget who, whose opinion you, you might hear. Don't listen to it. Just love yourself. Learn to love yourself. Go deep inside. Go for a walk. Connect. I want to do this. Okay, what inside me is holding me back? The answers are there. The answers are in all of us. It's just that we have been programmed by so many organizations and by society to not listen to our inner guidance. And our inner guidance is connected to source energy. I mean, we all have that ability. We all have that ability. We all have that ability, whatever it is. Yeah. So learn to love yourself, learn to love yourself, and then just do it. Today is the day I'm going to be a writer. Today is the day I'm going to create a new business to help people. Today is the day I'm going to start my dog walking business. Today is the day I'm going to start sewing. Today is the day, not Sunday. And I would say that would be your mantra. Today is the day I'm going to fill in the blank, not Sunday anymore. No more so some days. No more so, some days. That's a great no. note to end on. David Von Braun. Make sure you connect with David on his website. And David, thank you for sharing everything that you did with us today. I really appreciate it. And I know everybody watching is going to take away a well, lot. I hope it helps somebody. I hope it was yeah. meaningful to someone. I really do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we will see you again soon.